Welcome everyone to this um, little um, overview of the new features that we have for, for uh, DCI's uh, 236. Um, <clears throat> so as some of you know, like 236 was a quite uh, comprehensive release. Um, we actually had more than 500 issues in total being um, fixed for this one, encoding uh, across features and, uh, and bugs and other minor, minor improvements. So um, today we're gonna have an um, overview of the different sort of features that came into this release. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna have Scott present some of the new features for analytics. We're gonna have Marcus um, and Mike present some of the features for tracker. And then Austin McGee is gonna lead the section on the platform improvements. And, and finally, we're gonna have uh, Jose uh, covering the Android improvements and features that we did. So as some of you know, this was a quite, quite strong feature uh, release. So we have a lot of interesting new things such as uh, scatter plots in analytics, uh, legends, uh, a new way to for, for searching for items um, and a lot of goodies for the analytics. Um, on the tracker, we had a lot of significant performance improvements. We have seen now that uh, the system is a lot more scalable compared to previous versions. Um, and for platform, we have some interesting new features for outlier detection. Uh, we have OpenID Connect support, better translations, and so on and so on. So a lot of good stuff to, to look forward to. So with that little introduction, I will leave it over to Scott to start talking about the analytical features that we have. So, uh, go ahead, Scott. Great. Thanks, Lars. And I appreciate the little bit of foreshadowing there on the features. All right. Let's, um, so I'm Scott Rispatrick, I'm the DHIS2 Analytics Product Manager, for those of you who don't know me. And as Lars said, we did have a really, really feature-packed uh, release for 236, a lot of really cool stuff to go through. I'm going to go through it quite quickly here, but please do go back and watch the video, or please reach out in the community practice if you have any questions. Um, we might have some time for some Q&A uh, at the end of the session here, so uh, hopefully we can get some questions live. But Please, uh, the number one rule is don't suffer in silence in DHIS2 world. So if you do have questions, to reach out to us in the community practice. Okay, so here, hopefully you can all see my screen and let's just go through the, the latest and greatest for 236. We're gonna start with the dashboard as we always do. And a couple of cool things happened on the dashboard. The first one that I'm going to talk about now is the dashboard filter edit. So we know that lots of folks are building dashboards and you're building dashboards at high levels. And you put a lot of time crafting these dashboards. They have certain, um, um, a very specific narrative that is, that is around the dashboard. And the people who are making the dashboards want to make sure the users of those dashboards are following that narrative, right? They're, they're getting the point. And there are a lot of features on the dashboard that may detract or take away from that narrative. One of the major ones is the filter option. So if I click on the filter option, you can see that I can filter a dashboard by basically any dimension, org unit, periods, uh, area, donor, et cetera, um, that I have available to me as a user. Different users may have different dimensions, but if you're like an admin user, you probably would see everything. Many users would see dimensions that may not apply to that dashboard, meaning that they could apply one of these that doesn't necessarily uh, is not necessarily attributed to the data. And they may just kill their dashboard. It may break the dashboard, essentially. Nothing would show up. That could be very confusing. So now as a dashboard owner, I'm actually able to go into the um, edit. And I can see here, we have an option called um, filter settings. And if I go to filter settings, I can have the option to allow filtering by dimensions or only allow filtering for selected dimensions. If I click only allow filtering for selected dimensions, then I'm able to see all of the dimensions that I have select that I have available to me and turn on the certain ones that I only want the users of this dashboard to be able to filter by. So if I now um, click confirm here and save my changes, then when I go back to this dashboard, you see that now I only have the filters available to me that I have um, said should be applicable to this dashboard. Okay. Now let's take a look at some of the options that we have within each dashboard item now. In each dashboard item, you see that we have now this three dot expansion menu up in the right-hand corner. If I click on this for the dashboard item, 
that you see we have our typical options that we used to have kind of lined up there within each dashboard item. So we can view as a table, view as a map, open in data visualizer, show interpretations, and we have a new one. The new one is view full screen. So if I click view full screen, then you see that my dashboard item, in this case, this bar uh, column chart, excuse me, will become the tire size of your screen. And I can have the typical interaction. So I can highlight certain columns. Um, and if I want to exit out of the view full screen, I can just go up in the right hand corner where I see my minimize button. And then I'm back to my dashboard. We, we appreciate this is a powerful feature to be able to share data directly from the dashboard. We want people to be able to look at their dashboard, plug into a projector or uh, share their screen on a, on a teleconference call and to be able to present the data large so that you know, they can communicate around the data more easily. So you'll see that this view full screen is available for all dashboard items. That includes charts, maps, and pivot tables. The next feature that I want to talk about is the new dashboard progressive web app. So I'm actually gonna to present to you my phone here. Can I just get a thumbs up from one of the facilitators? You can see my phone screen. Okay, thanks guys. All right, so you're looking at my phone now and I am going to show you um, the dashboard from uh, the mobile phone. And in 236, we did a lot of work to make sure that the dashboard that you're seeing on the web will also be performant and render properly when you bring it onto a smartphone. So in this case, what you can see is I'm just going to, I'll show you the entire order of operations here. We're gonna to go to, um, I've, you see I've logged into play.dhis2.org. And right now I'm looking at the dashboard on my phone and because I'm in portrait mode, I am seeing all of the dashboard items rendered vertically. So they're kind of one on top of each other. And I can scroll through here and see all those dashboard items. Uh, you see what the dashboard actually looks like right behind my phone screen um, on, the, on the web version. At the top of it, we have our dashboard menu. So you can see I can scroll through my various dashboards here, move in between my dashboards. Underneath that, we have the ability to star a dashboard as we've always had. In our mores option, we have three options here available, star, dashboard, show description, and print. So I can print directly from my phone if your phone's connected to a, to a printer. Um, or of course you can save it as a PDF uh, through the print option as well. Uh, within each dashboard item, you see that I have my same items, my same options that I had on the web version. So table, maps, interpretations, and view full screen. And I can go and view full screen on my phone. Uh, a little bit cramped here in this particular chart, but you can see the functionalities, at least as an example. If I now turn my phone into yeah, landscape mode, you see now the dashboard on the phone is rendering or displaying similarly to how it shows on the, um, on the web version of DHIS2. And you also see that I have additional options here at the top of the dashboard. For example, I can edit my dashboard and I have all of the same edit functionalities that I do in a, in a normal dashboard on the web, but just here on my phone. So I can add things, change the layout, et cetera, add descriptions. I also have my, uh, my filters, so I can now filter the dashboard items. And what if I wanted to actually have this show up as more similar to an application on my phone? I, you know, I didn't wanna go into Chrome or Safari or whichever web browser that you're using on your phone every time I wanted to look at a dashboard. Well, that's very easy. And, and all these dashboard, excuse me, and all these um, web browser apps that are available for phones, almost all of them have an option to, add a web page to your home screen. So I'm gonna click add to home screen and you're gonna see it's going to pop up here and get, make, force me to give it a name. So DHIS2 dashboard's fine. It makes sure that it has an icon and now it's added to my home screen. So if I now rotate back to my normal phone, I'm gonna scroll over and now you see here, oh, there we are. Now you see here, the dashboard has been added as an looks and fills as an application directly to my home screen. So I'm gonna click on that and it takes me as a shortcut right into the web browser to look at my dashboard. Um, so this gives you all the power, powerful features of the dashboard in the convenience of your cell phone. So you can take it on the go, you can share data in the field uh, um, 
a really a powerful step in, in being able to communicate and share data in DHIS2. Right now, this in the, in the initial release of 236, this only works online. So if your phone were to be offline, you would not be able to show your dashboard. We are coming out with a new version, hopefully in the next several weeks, to be able to store or cache some analytics offline on your phone so that you would be able to see some um, dashboards that you had seen previously and then gone offline, you would be able then to see them offline. Okay, so let me get my phone out of the way. And now let's go in and look at some of the other analytics applications. So I'm gonna go into this column chart and I'm going to say, uh, view, oh, no, sorry, not view full screen. This is my fault. Got a little ahead of myself. We're gonna go into now open and data visualizer app. So quite a lot of new things in the data visualizer app here to quick you, click quickly, excuse me, walk you through. Um, the first one that I want to show you is for bar and column, column charts, we have added the ability to add legends to them. So if I go to my options menu, you see in bar and column charts, we now have a legends tab. I'm going to click on that legends tab and choose display legend. And then I have two options. The first one is use predefined legend per data item. And the second one is select an, a single legend for the entire visualization. The first option really applies if you've already set a legend to be uh, in to your, um, to your indicator or data element. For example, you have a, a coverage indicator and you have a certain cover, coverage legend assigned to that through the maintenance app. If you don't have that, or if you want to apply a different legend, you can say select a legend for a single, select a single legend for the entire visualization. And when I do that, I give the option to select from the various legends. I'm going to come down here and select this percentage red to green, click update. And now you see that all of my bars have changed color corresponding to the legend class that they fall into. And if I hover over one of the bars, you can see that for this particular um, uh, data value, 88.7, falls into this green 80 to 90 um, legend class. So it essentially makes it a lot easier if you to, to uh, um, use your legends to quickly spot low performing or high performing or over performing um, uh, values directly from the data visualizer app for bar and column charts. Okay. The next feature that I'm going to show you is the introduction of a new chart type, and that is the scatter chart. So when I go to scatter chart, actually here, let's just make a blank and then go to scatter chart. So when I go to scatter chart, you, see, you, you will see that I have a new layout menu here at the top. I have my vertical axis, my horizontal axis, my points, and my filter. You can see that for the vertical and horizontal axis, we have data locked to those axes, meaning that you'll be able to turn on one data item per, per horizontal and vertical axis. We also then have the organizational units locked to the points. Um, so the points that you will see will be the organizational units that you have turned on there. And then your filter is period. So let's turn on some data. So I'm just going to click in the vertical axis, click on the data icon. And while I'm here, let me show you another really cool feature. In the data selection uh, dimension, we now have a universal search for all data items, meaning that you know, gone are the days where you had to know the difference between a data element, an indicator, a event data item, a program indicator. All of those are shown here together and they're just alphabetized. Um, you can, of course, move in between them if you want, but now the user just really needs to know the name of the data item that they're looking for, as opposed to knowing the, whether it's an indicator or a program indicator or event data item makes it a lot more user friendly and, and hopefully makes people a little bit easier to find the data that they're looking for and whereas they don't have to know exactly what it is defined in DHIS2 as. So I'm going to just search for A and C. And when I search for A and C, you can see that I'm having different data items come. Uh, you see that I have a standard data element here and I hover over it. You see that each one of these different um, data items has a different 
um, icon next to it indicating what kind of data item it is. So it's a data element. This one is an indicator. If I scroll down a little bit more, you can see that I'm finding some event data items. Scroll down a little bit more. Um, then I start to get to some uh, program indicators and uh, I'm sure there's some data sets in there as well. So what I'm gonna turn on right now is ANC first visits. Go ahead and hide that. And my horizontal axis, I'm gonna turn on ANC second visits. Hide that. My org units, I'm just gonna make this cool. We're gonna just go ahead and start and turn on all of the facilities within the country so that we see lots of points. Click update. And now we have a scatter plot. Each point here, each screen point is representing a health facility. And you can see that the data we're looking at is for the last 12 months. A couple of cool things that we can do here. You can see that they're all really quite clustered together at the bottom. But if I wanted to appreciate um, a little bit more clearly distribution, I can click and drag. And you see that it makes this blue window over a certain area. And then that'll automatically zoom me in. So I can keep clicking and dragging until this, this cluster, I can start to appreciate individual health facilities. Okay. If I wanted to reset the zoom, I just come up into the top right corner and click zoom reset. And then I'm back to my original view. Now, one of the really powerful things about scatter plots is the ability to apply outlier analysis to them. And so that's what we've also enabled here building from the experience that we've had with the WHO Data Quality App, which many of you are using and following the WHO Data Quality Principles and Guidelines. So if I go to my options, in the scatter plot, we have an additional tab that's unique to the scatter plot, and that's the Outliers tab. Uh, if I click on the Outliers tab, then I can um, choose Outlier Analysis, and DHIS2 will automatically perform Outlier Analysis for you using three different methodologies. Uh, so we put in interquartile range, Z-score or standard score, and modified Z-score. Really the most robust ones to use are interquartile range and modified Z-score. Um, I'll go ahead and um, leave it to interquartile, or I'll just change it to modified Z-score. Then you have to define a threshold factor. Uh, the threshold factor defines essentially how many standard op or how many standard deviations away from the mean, or in this case, the median you want to go. Um, we're going to provide more specific guidance about what, you, what each one of these methodologies are and its appropriate threshold factor um, in our guidance documentation. But as it stands right now, it kind of automatically fills for you. Uh, um, and I'm going to choose extreme lines. Now, extreme lines is a way for uh, DHIS2 to indicate to you which one of those outliers are deviating so significantly to throw off national statistics. So I'm going to use extreme lines. Turn this on, and there you go. So now DHIS2 has plotted the a mean or median uh, linear regression. And then you see, if I zoom in a little bit more here, you see that we have our threshold lines on either side of that uh, mean linear regression. And the points that are showing up in red are considered outliers. Now, where are those outliers that are really throwing off national statistics? Well, you can see that if they're above or beyond these um, extreme threshold lines, which you see here as dotted lines, then this, these values are really throwing off your national statistics. These are some serious outliers that would definitely need to be corrected or investigated. So you can see this one here, uh, these over here, these are all extreme outliers. Okay, next we are going to move away from Data Visualizer and move over to the Maps app. And in the Maps app, we have, over the last uh, several months, started to form very close collaborations with the Google Earth Engine uh, and WorldPop, in, uh, as well as Grid3. And through those collaborations, we've managed to gain access to a lot of additional um, uh, kind of third party or um, data that is available through, um, that is produced through WorldPop and made available through the Google Earth Engine. And that is clearly displayed here on these middle layers, the population, population age, um, gender uh, uh, breakdown, the elevation map precipitation and temperature map. Um, and so we can do some really cool additional analyses here. Again, these data values, these layers are provided through WorldPop Google Earth Engine. These um, are not coming from the data that you have stored in your DHS2 instance. 
Um, but a cool, some cool things we can do here. So let's look at the population age and gender breakdown. When I open this tab, you'll see that I'll have to select some groups. Let's say I wanna see the total under five population, for example. So I'll select men zero to one, men one to four, and do the same thing for women zero to one, one to four. All right, and then we have some aggregation methods. We have mean and sum. Uh, we also see that we have median, max, med, um, standard deviation of variance, but let's just leave mean and sum here uh, for the time being, for, example, for the sake of example. I'm gonna go over to my period, we'll leave that 2020. Um, that's the most recent available data from roll pop. And my org units, we'll just leave that at district now. We don't need to come worry about style, we're gonna come back to that. I'll click add layer. And this is gonna take probably about five to 10 seconds because it's pulling the data from, again, world pop uh, and directly into your map here. So we'll just give it a second. All right, here it comes. And you can see that I have each district outlined. And if I click on that district, then I have the population provided by world pop um, for the under five population. So for example, I have uh, people per hectare, the mean is 0 0.078, and the total sum is 75,441 for this district from Bali. Okay, you can see, I can see that for any, any district. I also have this heat map here so that I can see um, where some of the under five population is clustered. Uh, and that's the heat map is based upon the legend here, which is people per hectare. A couple of cool things that we can do with this is that we can make um, boundaries or buffers for individual health facilities. So let me show you an example of that. I'm gonna go back to my org units tab. I'm going to remove districts and let's go to facility. And now let's check out style tab. I'm going to make sure that I apply a buffer and that buffer is going to be 5,000 meters, you know, five kilometers. And now I'm gonna click update. And again, five to 10 seconds as we pull the data from Pop. This just got a little bit slower, probably because a lot of folks are playing around with it, doing it on their own right now. All right, and now it's finally come, and it's you know it's pulling in about three thousand org units for this Sierra Leone demo database, and you can see that there is a five-kilometer buffer applied to it. And as I zoom in, you can see the health facilities. You can see those, that five kilometer buffer. If I click on the health facility, you can see that for Yale Community Health Center, they have a total of under five population within a five kilometer radius of uh, 2,770 uh, children, male and female. Um, of course, this is coming from rural pop. This is not necessarily your national statistics. Um, but it is a, uh, you know, a, a, in, in most cases, a, a very verified and accurate population estimate. Okay. Just to point out that we are really, um, this is, a, a, again, a new addition to DHIS 2, 236. This is a really, though, we're scratching the surface of what we're actually able to provide here. Uh, we'd very much like folks to use this, play around with it, tell us what, how they would like to see it, how would they like to see it displayed differently. We could potentially start to explore things like facility catchments, um, uh, boundaries based upon driving distance and other geological features or uh, geographic features. Um, uh, we can look at better um, uh, clustering or risk um, uh, projection mapping. There's just a whole lot here and, and really through our collaboration with WorldPop and Grid3 uh, 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 via Google Earth Engine, there, we, there, there's just a tremendous amount that we can do. And so I encourage you guys to uh, use this feature, play around with it, and do communicate back to us how you'd like to see it improved or if we can make anything um, a little easier for you. All right, so now we are going to move away um, from the maps and we're going to come briefly back to the dashboard. 
Um, and then back to these dashboard item menu. So on the dashboard item menu, we appreciate that many folks are making dashboards. Um, and again, they are making a dashboard for a very specific purpose. They don't want the users of that dashboard to change the dashboard, um, the visualization type for each dashboard item. For example, uh, you know, someone at national level has finally crafted this dashboard and they put this bar chart here for a very specific purpose. And they don't want the users that are say at district level that they're pushing this dashboard down to, to get confused by the data by changing it to a table or a map, or maybe some of these other options are not appropriate. Um, so what we have now available is in the system administration app. So I'm just gonna, or sorry, system settings app. I'm going to go to the analytics tab. And you see that we have these four options now here at the bottom. These options are to disallow users from being able to uh, switch between vi uh, visualization types, um, being able to open a, a dashboard in, the, in its app, being able to show uh, the interpretations and being able to view the dashboard on full screen. So I am just gonna turn off all of these, but full screen. You'll see I have full screen there still checked. This app saves automatically. So as I go back to the dashboard, And now look at my options for each dashboard item. Looks like my uh, our demo database is slowing down here a little bit. Okay, and then you see that I have only uh, view full screen available. And I, I apologize, I think my internet connection here at the university is cutting out a little bit. Hopefully we can fix that in the edit of the video. All right, and so that is it for 2.36. Um, one quick announcement that I wanted to make is our, our, our old favorite, the Pivot Tables app is no longer supported. 236 is the last version that this app will be included on. When we release 237 towards the end of this year, we will no longer see the pivot tables app. And please don't freak out. All the pivot table functionalities have been replicated. In fact, if you can find everything there in the data visualizer app that was in the old pivot tables app. So I think with that, I will hand it over to the next presenter. Uh, which I believe is uh, Marcus. Thank you, Scott. Let's see if I'm able to share my screen here. And there. All right. So assuming you can see my screen now, I will, um, uh, my name is Marcus Wecken. I'm going to take us through some of the tracker features that is released in 236. Um, I think we're uh, stuck on Scott's screen. Hold on a second. Scott, did you stop your screen share? I did, but I think Zoom has frozen on me. I was offered to force and your uh, sharing and start mine and I tried to do so but uh, maybe this didn't work then All right, I'll stop and try sharing again did I successfully take over Scott's screen I can see it now. All right, thanks. I just switched it. I'm not sure. I think both are still shared, but it should work for everyone. All right. I'll trust you to uh, scream out if you can't see the screen. Um, yes. Uh, the in the tracker uh, in the tracker team, we have um, we have been uh, focusing mainly on two things, and uh, one of them has been um, the new capture app 
which I will get to shortly. Uh, the other one is um, performance. And um, from the overview of 236 that you can also reach in the DHS2 website, um, you will see that the first listed item is the performance improvements. And there's a general description there. Uh, and to give a little bit of background on what has actually happened on the, on the team is that um, as we have seen uh, COVID and COVID vaccination um, scale up and roll out in, in uh, the countries around the world, um, we have also uh, been working very hard to take away bottlenecks as they have been showing up in, in country. Um, we have especially been working with the countries like Bangladesh, Indonesia, Ghana and Cambodia to, to find and, and remove these bottlenecks um, as they have shown up. Um, we have also set up an extensive um, test lab laboratory where we are monitoring and analyzing um, the performance of the, of the tracker uh, endpoints. Um, so during 236, we have been working very hard to fix and improve the, the performance. And this is uh, not something that has been exclusively released in 236. Uh, most of the work was put down in the last months, um, but uh, it has also been backported to 234 and 235. So you will see a specific mention of some versions here. And as long as you're on these versions or newer, you will have uh, these general improvements in your in your code base, and we would like to say to anyone that uh, doesn't see that, that are still running um, older versions of DHS um, and uh, trying to scale up these versions uh, might be hard, and uh, we would uh, give a very strong recommendation to upgrade um, if that's a possibility. Upgrade to two thirty four four, two thirty five two, or two thirty six zero. Um, so to give a little bit of insight into these improvements, um, I decided to give you a little demo, a little side-by-side -side demo here. And um, you can see I have logged into two instances and they look exactly the same. Uh, the only difference is that one of them is based on 234.3 and the other one is based on 234.4. Uh, to the right, I have the 234.4 version and to the left, I have the older 234.3 version. The first thing I can do is to, to refresh this, uh, this uh, working list here. And this is a very long list. Um, we can see the first 50 items, but uh, the actual list of, uh, of enrollments in this uh, organet is over 600,000. And um, uh, if we were going to uh, go through all the items, we would have had to click many times on the next page button down here. Um, I'm still going to reload this list just to see the comparison in these two instances. And um, it's not a good idea to make such long lists and use such long lists. And uh, it might be a better idea to make a custom working list for your users. So you don't have to, uh, you don't get the, the first 50 of 600,000 items, but we can see it still works pretty well here in the updated uh, 234.4 version. Um, if you compare to the 234.3, where, where this actually took a bit of time. Um, uh, around 20 seconds uh, in the older version. Uh, there, there we go. Uh, then I'm going to do a search and um, I will uh, do that side by side as well. I will prepare a search for demo user here. And the same here. And this is searching around 3 million TEI in this instance. And you can see that um, on the uh, uh, new instance, the, um, the um, updated 34.4 version, um, the result is uh, shown in a second or two. Uh, in the older, it takes around 10 seconds, which is might not be terrible, but it might be hard if, um, uh, if you're going to work and search a lot of records during the day, then those take 10 seconds would be um, would not be uh, any, any, anything good. Um, then uh, the last indication I'll show on the performance uh, change is the um, 
under the hospitalization here, I'm, I'm going to change a data element for you. And as you might know, when changing a data element value uh, in, in the tracker capture app, the, uh, the value is sent to the server. And while waiting for, for the server to update uh, the value, it will be yellow. When the server has been updated successfully, the, the field will turn green. Uh, so I'll do this in the old 234.3 first. Um, I'm going to show you cha a change. You can see the field is yellow for a second or two. Uh, this is a second or two where the server is working very hard. Uh, so this is quite significant. Uh, if we compare to the updated version, you can see that uh, such an um, update uh, has an instant, um, um, instant response time. Uh, and this will have a, a big impact on a server that is hammered with a lot of requests like this um, every day. So uh, with that, I'm going to leave the, um, the uh, comparisons. And just to reiterate, I was showing you an example from 2.34. Uh, the same uh, difference you would see in 2.35 and uh, the same uh, enhancements that is in both these two versions are also in 236. So any of these three uh, versions would be um, would be uh, representative of um, of what I just um, just demoed. Um, the next feature I'm gonna have a look at is the tracker functionality in the capture app. This is another of the big uh, pushes that. Um, that uh, is um, uh, that we're working on on the tracker team. Um, we have uh, we have been working on on the um, capture app for some releases, and if you look at the capture app in two thirty six, um, there is uh, some more functionality and some new uh, new functionality that you will see here, and also some changes. One of them is the capture icon, which has been updated now. Um, but this is, this is the same app that you uh, were using before. Uh, opening the capture app, you might observe that the uh, program on registering Orgunet has changed place. Um, that is uh, mostly a um, uh, aesthetic thing. Um, you can still select uh, your uh, Orgunet and your program in the order that you want. Um, there's also some smaller changes to make the top bar a little bit more compact and to prepare it for uh, more tracker functionality. Right now I selected a case uh, single event program, malaria case registration, and this program has been supported in the, in the um, capture app for a while. Um, what is new is that I can also now uh, since I am uh, a one user that um, that uh, has access to both the event and the tracker program, I can switch directly to the tracker program and uh, work with uh, the tracker program in the same way as I did for the event program. So the main value that we think we can deliver uh, and we are, are delivering in 236 uh, is that um, it is now possible for a user that has access to event and tracker program to seamlessly work in both types of programs in the same app. As we see, I switched to the malaria focus investigation, which is the tracker program, and I'm able to, um, to play around with, uh, with the uh, filters. Um, and uh, that was not uh, this month in the same way that I've been um, able to uh, for event programs for a while. Um, I can uh, add filters uh, or focus on um, uh, filter on other things um, in the same way that we always have been able to do for uh, single event uh, programs. Uh, we also have three working lists here uh, that uh, you're able to switch between, much like in the old tracking capture app. Um, just as an example, um, the new button up here is now um, working uh, for tracker programs as well. And since I'm currently in the tracker program, I'm given the option here to add the new focus area in the malaria focus investigation. So if I click that, you'll see the uh, registration form that looks very much like the one in uh, the old tracker capture app. 
Um, I am able to switch program directly if I want, and instead add the case uh, to Engelehun if I want. I can also switch Organit and switch to Nyandama if that's uh, where I'm working. And um, you can see we have done a little addition at the very bottom of the screen here. Uh, we are um, now giving a hint to the user that might have scrolled out of the no longer seeing their top menu. It might be useful to know where you're adding and what data, what program you're adding to. Um, it's also possible to just deselect the program here and, um, and add, add a new uh, entity, for example, a person, without enrolling into any program. Right now, though, I'm going to add a new focus investigation, and I'll add it to Engelehun. And the name will be added during demo, like so. Now, though, you will see that after adding, I'm navigated to the tracker capture app. And this is the old user interface that you might know from before. Um, the reason why you're navigated here is that while this page is uh, we are hard at work building this page in the new uh, capture app. We were not ready to release it by the time 236 was um, was ready, and um, and um, we will release this page in 237. Um, the um, user is therefore navigated to this old tracky capture app, and you can continue working here um, on the data, uh, and then uh, even changing the profile. Um, change there. And then when you click back, you're taken back to the uh, tracker capture, uh, sorry, to the capture app. Um, and you can continue working where you where you were. Uh, observe the, the first record here is the one that I added. It's called added during demo changed. Um, I will now show um, uh, if I if I click anything in the menu here um, or search, for example, for um, a malaria focus, and I can search by attributes. And the name was at the during something. Um, I can also open the the record, and when I do, I will be navigated back here. Um, there is a, something that um, I want to mention right here because um, the reason why I'm navigated back to the um, to the capture app is that there is a URL parameter called return URL which uh, contains um, uh, the URL for where to go back. Um, and this is um, something that was implemented to support this seamless integration here. But uh, this is also something that can be um, can be um, used by you if you're building your own app um, or making your own workflow somehow. You can navigate into this page, and when you click back here, you can, might go back to your own app, for example. Um, while we are in this form, I will show one of the other smaller features that um, uh, is uh, down here, the keyboard-only data entry. Um, we, uh, fr uh, there was pressure from, from um, there has been pressure for, for, from users for a while to be able to go uh, more efficiently with the keyboard uh, through the um, data entry process. And especially this uh, drop down menus uh, and checkboxes and yes, no has been hard. And now uh, you'll have to take my word for it. I'm not using the mouse. I'm uh, using Enter to open this uh, drop down. I can tab in and tab to the op option I want and select it with Enter. Uh, I can also search uh, when there is many uh, re records. I can search and select with Enter like this. Um, we also support um, checking and unchecking uh, radio buttons and checkboxes uh, now. This is, of course, something that's a principle for the new tracker capture app and the new tracker functionality in the capture app as well. 
um, and was uh, fixed here because um, uh, there is still a lot of users using the old app um, and uh, adding data with keyboard has been um, something that has been missed by the users that is entering a lot of data. Um, another smaller change is uh, the full name in notes. Uh, instead of just seeing the username, we will now see the uh, full name of the user that added uh, added uh, data. So um, I have a note here and hover it, I will see uh, this, the full name uh, registered by um, instead of just the username. This is useful when the username is your personnel number or something that does not make sense to other users uh, mainly. And with that, I will leave the, um, the topic of the uh, tracker capture in the capture app up here. Um, in 237, we will have uh, more of the tracker functionality in the capture app. Um, and um, uh, you will see that um, uh, there, there is uh, less or no situations where we would navigate to the old uh, tracker capture app in, in 237. But for now, this is, uh, this is what we are delivering in 236. And then I will go to the last a big feature that um, that I'm going to cover today, and this is the new endpoint point for importing tracker data. This is a feature we have been working on for um, well over a year, um, and we have been working in the early releases. We have been working on this uh, new endpoint. The the reason is that even though we are constantly enhancing the old endpoints for, for tracker data and the, the backend for tracker data. Um, we have seen that um, in order to make big progress, we would need to rewrite the old endpoints and make new ones. And in the new endpoints, we would build um, the functionalities um, that we want needed. We will use a new architecture that is more maintainable, easier to, um, easier to optimize, and more expandable with functionality. So in the 236, we are releasing the new endpoint. It's being released side by side with the, um, with the existing endpoints. And that means for anyone in that is using tracker endpoints in their custom apps, they can still use their, their apps with 236. Uh, nothing is being removed. Uh, but in 236, we are also releasing this new endpoint side by side with the old ones. Uh, this is um, mainly to give app developers and scripters um, and anyone interested the opportunity to integrate with the new endpoint um, if they upgrade and try 236. In a later version, we will completely replace the old endpoints with the new one, but we have not decided on when this will happen. And um, we have no information on that today. Um, it is a couple of releases into the future for sure. And we're happy to take input as well from you if you have any input on that topic. Um, I will show you a little bit uh, of the new endpoint and uh, to make it visible, I think I need to stop sharing and then share a specific window. So I will do that uh, right now. Um, there and share only my postman. And this uh, seems very technical, but I will uh, try to narrate as well. The, the new endpoint is uh, located at uh, API slash tracker. And I can send data to this, um, this endpoint um, much in the same way that uh, we sent uh, data in the, in the old endpoint. Um, 
And one of the differences between the old and new endpoint is that the new endpoint is, is um, uh, asynchronous first. And um, I'm uh, getting a reference back to check how my import is going um, as a link here. And I will need to go and ask for a result from, uh, from the um, API and see whether my import was done. It is also possible to do synchronous uh, direct imports if you want and need that, but we are trying to encourage asynchronous first. So if I go and check my job here, I will see that um, I got an error back. And this is an error that might be interested, um, interesting to, to, um, uh, to look at. Uh, it um, says that um, it's generated by a program rule and uh, that either first or last name needs to be supplied. And here we see one of the things that is new in this new tracker importer. It's no longer running only rules for sending messages. It's, uh, it's running all the program rules for validating, um, assigning, hiding, and, um, and other uh, operations. And it's possible from the API side to generate error messages like this. Uh, this one is an error message that states that I need either first or last name to be supplied. And in the payload that I sent, I did not send um, any of those uh, in. Um, I will in enter it here and uh, send the payload again. And again, I will open the job. I will look for the report. And I see that the import has been completed successfully. Uh, this is because I fixed the problem that the pro program rule reported, the cross-validation problem. The last thing I'm going to show you today is the, that we also have a new um, endpoints for uh, retrieving tracker data. And um, that is um, a very simple uh, demo. Uh, the reason for having this other endpoint is mostly that we there is some changes to how the, this payload looks. There is some changes to the format. So if you're integrating with the new endpoint, then you should go here and um, uh, oops, let me see. You should use the new endpoint, which is also under tracker, track entities and ID. So um, this um, is the payload that will match the one you need to send in when registering new um, tracked entities to the, in the new tracker importer. Um, and just um, reiterating this before I, uh, before I give the word to the next um, speaker, the new endpoint is um, mostly released in 236 so that you can integrate with it and start trying it. It is faster, it has more functionality, and it is more maintainable uh, into the future. Uh, so this is the endpoint that, um, that will be the one that we should use for tracker data in, in future releases. With that, I will stop my sharing, and I will uh, hand it over to the next speaker, which I think is Austin. Thanks, Marcus. I'll go ahead and share my screen as well. So I'm going to cover the platform features that were introduced in the 236.0 release. I'll also talk a little bit about some of the API features that were introduced. Um, many of the improvements that were made in the platform for 236.0 are kind of behind the scenes. So they're not something that you would necessarily notice as a user um, or wouldn't, wouldn't be completely obvious to a user. Um, things like uh, API endpoints or uh, performance improvements. Um, but uh, I will demonstrate the, some of the ones that are uh, visible to users uh, and will point to some of the documentation for the, the features that were added that are less visible. Um, so I'm going to start off here with an outlier detection um, improvement, which was added to the data quality application in 236. 
Uh, here I have the data quality application in 236, and you can see that it's changed a little bit from the previous version of the data quality app. Um, I'm going to switch over here now to uh, just show you quickly the data quality app from 235. So this is before the most recent changes. Uh, and in 235 here, we have a bit of a different layout. It's using a, a less modern tech stack. I'll get into the improvements to kind of the underlying technology and some of these applications uh, that have been introduced to, to a, a wide number of applications. But you can see that here with some of the slightly improved styling. Um, but the functionality changes that have uh, been made in 236 here are we've combined the standard deviation and min-max outlier analysis into a single tab. So previously you had separate uh, standard deviation and min-max analysis um, operations that you could perform to detect outliers in your data values. Um, now we have just a single, now I'm back in 236 um, with the updated styling. And you can see that there's only one tab on the left here for outlier detection. I will select that. Um, and you'll note that you have a selection of algorithm here. So we have min max values and Z score or Z score, which is a, a derivative of standard deviation. So the, the, um, uh, the functionality is all still there that we had in those two, um, uh, those two tabs previously. Uh, but this has also now been uh, give, gives us the capability to expand to uh, additional algorithms for outlier detection, such as the ones that Scott outlined um, when he was demonstrating scatter plots and outlier detection in the data visualizer application. Um, so we will be adding more algorithms to this list in 237. Um, and it's important to note that the, these uh, outlier detection um, algorithms are running on the server. So they are, do perform quite well on large databases um, rather than uh, previously they had to be, be done in a, um, in a less performant way in the browser. Um, so let's go ahead and, and demonstrate this. I'm gonna select the morbidity uh, data set where I know there's some data um, for this particular, or that with some, with some outliers. Uh, I then select an org unit. Um, as usual, I can select any, any level of this org unit, but I'm gonna go ahead and just select Sierra Leone for all of the, uh, the top level org unit in this instance. Um, you can select a start and end date. You can select the algorithm you want to use. I'm gonna start with uh, Z-score. Uh, you can uh, select the thresholds, which is the number of standard deviations above the mean that you would, uh, you want, or uh, above or below the mean that you want to detect for this um, uh, outlier detection. And you can also select the maximum number of results that you want to return um, in this uh, endpoint. There are some advanced options as well, such as the, the start and end date for the data rather than the, the, where they were entered um, and uh, a sort order as well. So this is going to sort by the absolute deviation from the mean. We're gonna go ahead and click start, which will generate this report. Just a moment, hopefully. There we go. Um, so now we have a report of the uh, outliers for this particular data set. And um, you can see that there's the z-score or z-score here in this column. There's also the deviation from the mean, which is the absolute value. Um, that's the difference between the mean and this, um, uh, this particular value. And that will give you the, um, uh, that will give you the, the, the sort order for this list as well. Um, another feature that um, is in this uh, outlier detection um, is the ability to mark certain data values for follow-up. So you can mark, uh, for instance, I will say mark ARI treated with, without antibiotics and all other new. These are again, individual data values that are very high that probably need to be followed up by someone to correct those um, outliers. Uh, and we'll see how we, we get back, back, back to that in a, in a moment. Um, if I go that now back to this outlier detection, I can again, select different values here. I could select sorting by the, the Z score rather than the absolute deviation from the mean. And this is also, going to allow me to determine where that mean is calculated for the, um, uh, the deviations to be um, selected. Uh, on the left here, we have the tab for follow-up analysis. And if we now select the morbidity data set, 
and the parent or unit of Sierra Leone. Uh, we can select start and end dates here as well. I'm just going to leave those as the default. Click those for follow-up, and we'll see that we have these um, uh, two data uh, values that I marked for follow-up previously that are now available in this follow-up tab and can be followed up uh, individually. Um, you can then unfollow those if you would like um, to say that these are uh, these are okay. They're, they may look like outliers, but they're not actually outliers, and we can remove those from this list. So that's the first feature here that we have introduced in outlier detection or in the platform set of platform features, which is detecting outliers uh, in the data quality application. Um, you'll see, you'll be looking forward to um, more enhancements to data quality calculations in core applications, such as the Data Visualizer app and the Data Quality app, um, and particularly around performant uh, data quality analysis in large databases in the, in the near future. Second feature we have here is the introduction of generic OpenID Connect um, providers. Uh, previously, it was possible to uh, use Google uh, and Azure uh, for um, OpenID Connect. Uh, it's now possible to use a generic provider um, for any OpenID Connect provider that might be providing the, the credentials for the users of your system. Um, this is another one that's a little bit difficult to, to demonstrate because it involves um, updating uh, the dhs.conf um, for your particular instance and then having a, a generic DHS to, or sorry, a generic um, open ID connect provider to provide those credentials. Um, but we do have uh, extensive documentation on how to set this up in your dhs.conf. Um, and some, this is for Azure in this case, uh, and we can go down here to generic providers, which was added in 236. Uh, and this is how you would configure your uh, DHS2 instance to connect to a generic provider, such as in this, in this example, we're showing um, uh, an example of how to connect to the Norwegian uh, health service or OpenID Connect provider. The third feature that I want to talk about in uh, this platform highlights is the uh, improvements to uh, metadata translations that were introduced in 236.0. This has two separate um, kind of dimensions to it. The first is that we've made it much easier to uh, add metadata properties to the set of things that can be translated um, so that it uh, is much easier to adapt as the metadata model changes in DHS2. Um, so you should see many more um, properties of metadata items being able to be translated in the near future. Um, also, we've used that capability to make many more things translatable in 236.0 itself. So we have, as you can see, six different JIRA issues here for different things that were added to the set of translatable metadata properties. Um, and I will just demonstrate one of those here uh, today. Um, I'm looking at validation rule management here, and I will go ahead and translate my ANC2 is less than or equal to ANC1 validation rule. Um, I can go and click on the translate button and select a locale. I will select French. Uh, and we can see here that, sorry if my screen is a little too big or too small, but you can see here that we have description and instruction, whereas previously instruction was missing as a translatable property in 235. So this has been uh, improved in this case by adding the instruction property to something that can be translated in 236. Uh, and you'll see more and more of those that were introduced in both in 236 as well as will be uh, more, more readily um, added and updated in the near future. Another feature that we introduced in 236.0 is the uh, ability to set user account expiration for individual users in DHS2. Um, so I'm going to go to the user management application here, and I'm just going to select one of my one of my users in this system. Um, and you'll see that I have the ability now to set an expiration date uh, for this user. 
This is useful if you want to give someone access to your DHS2 instance, but you want the system to automatically prevent them from logging in after a certain date. You want to give them provisional access or just access to view data for a week or a month um, for a particular project or something like that. So you can go ahead and set this to uh, a particular date. Um, I'm going to say 2022 if we wanted this to be for another 18 months or something like that. But this could also be 2021 if we wanted it to, oops, that is not correct. 2021, if we wanted that to be um, just for the next six months or so. Um, this is uh, useful again for uh, security as well as um, more fine grained control of when users have access to your system. Similar to this, we have added the ability to disable inactive users. So not only can you set expiration dates on a particular user who you want to expire after a certain amount of time, but you can also set up a, a job in the scheduler application to automatically disable users who have been active, inactive for a certain number of months. Um, I will demonstrate that here now. Um, we can see uh, this is the new scheduler application, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just create a new job. This is going to be called disable inactive users. Oops. Disable inactive users. And I can select the, uh, the new job type, which is disable inactive users as well. Um, I can set this to run, let's say, every week. I'm going to insert that preset here. Uh, and I can then select a number of inactive months. This can be anywhere from one to 24 months. Um, and this will disable any user that hasn't uh, been active in the DHS2 system for that amount of time. So if I set this to 24, any user who hasn't been inactive in uh, two years will be automatically disabled when this job is run, uh, which happens every week in this case. Uh, if I then made this one, um, one month, it would uh, basically disable any user account when that user was inactive for one month. Um, so you can tune this as you'd like. You can then save that job, uh, and it will uh, begin to run every Monday at 3 AM as I set it to run, uh, and that will disable any users who have been inactive for one month at that time. Another feature that we've introduced into their 6.0 is the ability to up uh, specify data read sharing in SQL views. So previous to uh, this update in the 2.30, uh, uh, sorry, in the 2.35 release, so pr prior to 2.36, um, when you're looking at SQL views in the maintenance application, you can update the sharing on those, those views but you only have the ability to specify uh, metadata sharing on that particular uh, item. So this means that you can grant users access to, to view, the, um, view and edit the, uh, um, the, view, the SQL view itself. Um, and that is the same thing as granting access to the output of that view through the API. Um, so what we've introduced in 2.36, Dot zero is the ability to, if I move over here, I'm now looking at SQL view management in 236 and I open the sharing settings. Here I have the ability also to specify separate data access to a particular user or a particular group. So if I want my, my admin user to be able to, uh, my, sorry, I want my admin user to be able to edit and view the metadata and also uh, view the data for this particular SQL view, and I want a part another particular group of users or a, a particular user, let's say, um, let's say Gita. I want Gita to be able to uh, only view the, the metadata and to be able to view the data that comes out of this. So you can then grant access to users in a more fine-grained way to the output of a particular SQL view. This one uh, is a little bit behind the scenes as well, but I wanted to, to demonstrate it quickly. Uh, in the data administrator uh, administration application, you have the concept, uh, the ability to, to perform data integrity checks. Um, this will run over the entire database and check for any issues that happen. 
uh, that or any issues that are present in that database. Uh, I'm running this on my local host server, so I don't mess with the the server on the uh, on play. But it should be much more efficient, so it shouldn't actually ha have an impact there either. Um, but the, this has been significantly improved in terms of performance, so this runs fairly quickly. Uh, it still takes some time because it is running over the entire database, but we will see this come back in just a few more seconds. There we go. Uh, and now we see the data integrity report for this entire database and all of the, the issues that we could then go in and rectify. Um, this one I'm not going to demonstrate because it's another dhis.conf uh, update, but we do have the ability to disable program rule execution in dhis.conf. Um, which can uh, have some um, security benefits as well as just uh, gives you more fine-grained control over what runs on your server. Um, so we can uh, go ahead and look that up in the documentation if you'd like to disable program rule execution uh, in the uh, dhs.conf of your DHS2 instance. Finally, I wanted to cover core application modernization. Uh, for a large number of apps that we have in the DHIS2 set of core applications, we have uh, updated those to use the latest technology stack and much more, um, uh, much more modern and much more efficient um, uh, technology under the hood. Um, this is moving to the application platform, which we introduced uh, about uh, a year ago now, a little bit more. Um, so we now have about doubled the, the set of core applications that are running on that application platform and using the latest technology as well as uh, having the most up-to-date UI and, um, uh, and header bar and things like that. Um, so you can see here the list of applications that have been updated in 236 or are up to date in 236. And this is particularly useful for um, uh, a number of reasons. It, it helps for with maintenance. It also helps with consistency of look and feel of different applications uh, so that you have a consistent DHIS2 user experience across all the apps that are on this platform. Uh, but it also has some performance benefits that can be quite sizable as well. Um, you, we just put a few numbers here to show the improvements that have been made in the dashboard and the data visualizer applications um, by moving to this modern tech stack and also to in um, uh, doing some additional benef uh, optimization of bundle size. Um, this uh, has a, a big effect you can see in the dashboard application. Even on a very fast connection, it reduces by about 80% the, uh, the size of the initial download that the browser needs to do. Uh, and therefore also reduces the, the amount of time that it takes for that application to load. Um, so you can look for forward to some performance improvements in the speed with which applications load and run in 236.0, as well as coming, coming soon in other applications. I also wanted to go over particularly the scheduler application, which I already did a, a very quick demonstration of to show the disable inactive users job type. Uh, but this application has been um, refactored and, and um, redesigned to be more modern and to use that modern tech stack. Um, you can see in the 235, um, uh, the 235 version of this application has the same functionality but doesn't have the same look and feel um, as the new 236. Um, there are also a number of uh, improvements that have been made to uh, the, the functionality, um, but all the existing functionality should still be there. So you can, um, as before, create jobs. You, we can, for instance, create our analytics job that we want to run, um, analytics table export. We say we want to run that every day at midnight. Um, we could then change that to another time of day if we wanted to. Um, we can set the number of years to um, uh, say let's five years and we could save that job so that it will run in the near future. And then we have these jobs. We can also include the, the list of system jobs. We can manually run some jobs if we would like to. We can also uh, view and edit, um, view system jobs and edit custom jobs so that we can um, visualize what's going on. We can turn those jobs on and off. 
Um, and we can also filter them if we would like to. This is a just new look and feel for with the same same behavior uh, as the previous um, uh, scheduler application, and just an example of some of the modernization that we've done across many of our apps. I'll now move on to some API features that have been introduced in 236.0. Uh, these are again kind of behind the scenes, and um, so similar to what Mark has just showed, I will. Um, demonstrate these on a little bit of a more technical level, but I, I won't get too deep into it. And if it's something you're interested in, you can find uh, on, on our website, on the 236 overview, you can find links to the documentation for all of these new features that have been added. Um, some of them are small and some of them are, are quite a bit larger. So the first is the ability to uh, um, detect the uh, leader configuration for a cluster of DHIS2 servers. Um, that is now available at the new endpoint API cluster leader. Um, I won't get into too much about what this means. If you're running a DHIS2 in a cluster configuration, this could be quite useful for you. Um, the second feature here is data value follow-up. Um, we saw this actually in, uh, in practice in the data quality application when we marked several data values as uh, needing follow-up and then saw them show up in the follow-up list. Um, there is an, a, a new API that has been introduced to support that, which you can also use directly through the API if you're writing your own application or uh, writing some scripts for um, follow-up, for instance. The uh, documentation for that follow-up um, API is under data values here. Um, actually, it's down at the bottom. We have follow-up uh, and data value follow-up. You can use the uh, data values slash follow-up endpoint to set and uh, unset the certain data values for follow-up. I should say mark and unmark certain data values for follow-up. Uh, this is a, a small feature, but it can be quite useful um, as we uh, move into more and more situations where DHS2 is used across different time zones. Um, you can determine the time zone of the server that you are uh, connecting to through the API system info, info endpoint. Um, so we can see here we have not only the server date at the time this request was made, but also the server time zone. Um, and in the future, we may um, deprecate some of these um, uh, more relative time res responses in these endpoints to get absolute values. Um, but it still is quite useful to have this um, uh, uh, time zone specified in the result of that API request. Finally, um, another kind of small API feature that has been introduced into 36.0 um, in it is here. Yeah, in the, the API for validation results, we have a specific format that has been around for a while for getting the set of results that are um, affiliated with a particular org unit, a particular period, or a particular validation rule, or some kind of combination of those three. So you can use the this endpoint even in 235. So you can use this endpoint to get the set of results for this particular set of um, uh, properties. Um, and added in 236 is the ability to delete using those same uh, properties. So you can use the exact same uh, AP, uh, URL that you used to get the set of, for instance, the set of uh, validation results that are associated with these two org units uh, or uh, with a particular created date, et cetera. Um, and then you can use that same um, URL with the same filters and call it with the delete HTTP verb in order to delete those validation results from the database. Um, so that was a, the final addition that we have for the platform and API features in 236.0. Um, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Jose, I believe, for uh, to introduce the Android features that have been introduced. Thank you, Austin. Um, video. 
Share screen. Can you see my screen? I guess so. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Um, I am Jose Garcia, part of the Android uh, product management team. And first of all, I would like to say thank you to the, all the Android developers that has been uh, done all the hard work of making this release possible. Um, okay, so let's move ahead and let's discuss about, uh, let me present you the, the new features that uh, 2.4 has. Um, first of all, uh, some generic features. Um, so this version 2.4 is compatible with all the access to versions from 2.30. Okay? This means that we are compatible with at least seven access to versions. Uh, we have also removed the Google Play services, and this is because we want also to give other organizations the possibility of like probably if they want to publish this application in other like uh, Play stores, in other channels, and some of them are not compatible with Google Play services like a Android. So um, that's the reason because we, uh, we remove the Google Play services and also because we want to be completely open source. Um, also, uh, in this version, we are uh, starting to use a, a new tool, a new application in order to monitor how this app is being used, uh, usage by the community. And it's called Matomo. It's kind of similar to Google Analytics, but in this case, Matomo is also open source. Um, so yeah, basically, let me show you a bit how it, how it looks like. So here we are going to be able to track like a, a different uh, uh, vis, uh, visitors that this app has, different users. Uh, all the user information are, is anonymized, so we are we are not we are not collecting usernames or user IDs, nothing like that. But we're going to be able to see what are the devices that are being used, what are the features of the Android application that are more useful for the users, right? So to give you an example, we can check the visit logs and then we can see unless this is a profile and you see there is no any personal information uh, we don't know this person is a user but we don't, we don't know which which user is and this is id is internally from matomo and then we have here like the different uh, visits that this person has this user has may, been made in the in the android application okay and also we, as I said before, we, we, we can like check the internally the devices that, uh, that normally the, the, that the users are uh, using and what are tablets or smartphones, uh, which is also the Android versions and, and so forth. And I think that this is going to be useful as well for many organizations as well. So we would like to promote Matomo as a tool that other organizations can use. So all this information that is being sent to the is being sent to the to the our UIO central repository can be sent also to our Matomo uh, Matomo servers out there for that maybe other organizations will start using now. Uh, I will show you how you can configure this in a moment, uh, but for now let's move on. Uh, OpenID is already in 2.4, but it's going to be. Uh, useful when uh, for the next patch release in uh, in the access to in for 236.1. Okay, so then uh, this is going to make it possible the the um, the login without having for the user having to uh, they don't need to introduce the username or the password. They just in this case you see the screenshot over here that they can like login using a, a, the Google credentials. Okay. Um, in this case, the downside is like, it is not going to work with the, our regular application that you can download from Google Play. So the organization needs, needs to build their own APK. They need to build their own application because there are some secret words and passwords that are only specific for every implementation. I cannot be like in, uh, uh, general because uh, a lot of security concerns. Okay, so um, more generic features, the navigation bars. The navigation bars has been like completely revamped uh, and now the, the application, we believe that it looks much more modern. So now we can navigate uh, in, instead of using a scroll, a horizontal scroll, we can use navigation bars to navigate the TI list, the TI dashboards, uh, events and data sets. So let me show you how it works in a moment, uh, how it looks like. So for example, well, let me go first to the, to the Malera Case Diagnosis Treatment and Investigation Program. This is a tracker program. 
And then uh, you see here that if you want to have like a, oops, sorry. If you want to, um, to move to the map view, now you can enter, you can click the, the, the button here. Okay, and it will render, it will render a map. And the same with the, with the, for instance, with the navigation of the, of the, of the TI. So you can open any, any, um, any TI over here, for, for instance, this one. And then uh, you see that, okay, you can navigate through the, through the dashboard and then you can navigate through the relationships here. In this case, there is one relationship, mother-child, uh, or notes, you can enter any note here. So you can navigate using this uh, navigation bar. Uh, the same for events, but we're going to see the events in, in, in a moment. Um, okay, let's talk now about uh, uh, analytics. One feature that has been requested a lot uh, to Android is the possibility of having like a local, what we call local analytics. This is uh, analytics based on the data that has been stored in your device. And maybe this data has to be synchronized with the server yet, okay? But it's in your device. Um, and then we, when we talk about analytics, we are normally here uh, referencing, uh, for, for instance, pivot table, pivot tables, or many table, or a chart, okay? So uh, this is very challenging as we may have uh, some performance issues and there are a lot of possibilities as well. So we, the way that we are like attacking this feature is like a step by step. So this means that we are going to have like different Android versions that is that they're going to move be, uh, ahead and having more like a, a features for, for, for analytics. In this case, in 2.4, uh, we are just centering in the, uh, in the scope is the enrollment, okay? So we are centering in the, at the TI level. Okay, so in 2.5, that's going to be released together with 2.37, we plan to expand the functionality of analytics, probably in 2.6, and probably this is going to take us the whole thing, like probably the one year and a half from now. So let's see how it works right now. And so I'm going to uh, open a, a, a tracker uh, in, this, in, in the chat program. I'm going to open a, a TI here. Okay, and you see that now we have here a button. This is the, the, the analytic button, so you can navigate to the analytics. And what is being rendered, nothing new here because we already, in the previous version, we, we already uh, could like uh, uh, offer here the feedback or the, or the indicators. These are program indicators. Program indicators were, was working since a couple of versions ago, so nothing new here. But then we can see if we scroll down, we can see now the different charts, okay? In this case, this chart is representing how the, the weight evolution of, for, for an infant, okay? There's a monthly basis, and you see how this is evolving. The next chart represents the, the, the height, okay? So how does this work? So uh, what we are doing is like, uh, whenever you have a program that has a repeatable program stage, we, in this tab, in the analytic tab, we are going to be able to render in, in charts or in tables, like all numeric data, data elements that belong to a, a, to a repeatable program stage. So we can see how the values evolve over time, okay? Not only data elements, but also program indicators, which formula contains uh, a data element that, that belongs to a repeatable program stage, okay? Like this is the case of the daily average weight and daily is new child, but there are many other program indicators, okay? Uh, so here, this is the default behavior. So it will show all the possible combinations of all the data elements and program indicators that contains data elements of repeatable program stages. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to show you how you can be more granular with this and have more control about the different charts that you would like to expose to the users. Okay, just only want to mention here that uh, you can like change the, the chart type. If you click in these three buttons over here, this can change to, well, this, okay, yeah, to a table. Okay, and then you can navigate the values of the table. This can change to, to a bar chart. Okay, but let me just go again to the, and value. Value means like it's going to, only going to, it's going to display only the last value, okay? So I'm going back to a line chart, okay? And then I'm going to move forward. 
Legends. This is also new. We had Legends before in the previous versions, but it was for indicators and program indicators. So now we have Legends that applies a software data elements of a tracker program or an event program. So let me show you this one. Uh, and you will see how it looks like. Um, so I'm going to open this. Okay, here we go. So yeah, for example, if the age I enter in other number, like say that I'm going to enter uh, 90 and I'm moving to the next field, you see how the legend changes. okay? So this is going to work as well for events and tracker, work for both. Let's move forward. Now uh, I'm going to talk about the, the events. What is new in the events in this version? Uh, it is uh, the program indicators. In previous versions, as I said before, we have program indicators, but those program indicators was, were only working in the, for, uh, for uh, tracker programs, but now we have them as well in for, uh, for events. So how they are being rendered? So let me open this new program, the contraceptive voucher program. Okay, and in this one, I can open, I'm going to open the second event. And it's about the vouchers, redeem vouchers for a family planning methods. I have like here, we have here data elements of representing the IUDs or implants uh, as long-term family planning methods, but also others like bills or uh, injection for short-term methods. So now I have two program indicators. One is to count the number of uh, voucher redeems for, uh, for long-term methods and therefore short-term methods. So here, the long-term methods are the, the, the IUDs, eight, and then the implant, six. So I should have a result of, of 14. And now all this, yeah, here we, are, here we go, 14, and the 13 for the short-term methods. So now we have this, this now analytic tab over here. This will show up the, the uh, all program indicators that are linked to this particular uh, event. Again, as I said before, charts, and tables are only, for now, are only linked to the tracker programs, okay? And to the enrollment scope. So here we are not going to be able to see any charts or, 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 or uh, pivot tables, but we are going to be able now to see the, the, uh, the values for program indicators. Uh, also, um, now uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, data sets, what is new uh, for data sets. And for data sets, uh, also the indicators. So now the indicators are being calculated on the fly. So let me then go a bit to the to the web application. So if I'm going to maintenance and I'm going to data set um, to reproductive health. Okay, no, not here, but I just want to show the 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 um, the sections. Okay, antenatal care. So now if I if I scroll down, I see that there are two indicators that are linked to that particular section. Okay, that's important because if you want to have in the Android application, like a, for a particular data set, you want to have to visualize some indicators, you need to uh, you need to remember that you need to assign link those indicators to a particular section. Otherwise they're not going to show up. Okay. So let's see how this looks like in, 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 in Android. So I'm going to open my reproductive health data set. In this case, I only have one data value set for April 2021. Okay, and I have all these numbers there, the two for antenatal care visits, and this is the total, uh, 12. Okay, this is calculating on the fly. So if I am selecting here instead of a two, let me just put here five. So the value of this should be like 15, okay? so. Then you see uh, how this is being calculated on the uh, on the fly as well. Um, okay, let's move on. Okay, I'm going to talk about now about maps. So uh, if you remember, uh, in previous versions, uh, what we were able to show in a maps was uh, the uh, coordinates for the TIs, coordinates for the enrollment, and coordinates for the events. Okay. But now we are going to, to we are going to be able to show also uh, attributes and data elements of which value type is coordinate. Okay, so let me show you how it works. So in this case, I'm going to select the malaria case diagnosis treatment and investigation program. 
And okay, so I'm going to select the map view. And then um, because I have many, many, many TIs here, uh, so I'm going to just use my filter in order to only show the TIs that has been enrolled this month. So in this filter, I have to click on this month. And then it will show you, as you see, I am in Spain now, uh, the all the TIs that has been, um, let me zoom in my little bit. Okay, so I have these three, these three TIs, and right now they are only showing the, the, uh, the TI coordinates, okay? This is the default behavior, as the, the first, the, the first time that you open the map is going to show up only the, the, the coordinates for the TIs. But now you know that you, we have this this uh, we have this button over here. So well, you know that in this button you you you, defi you can use different map layers. Um, for instance, we have the if we like to see the relationships uh, of the index case and, and cases. So I can click here, and then it will show the relationships as well. Okay. This is not new, but this, I always like to highlight this one because uh, I, I don't know if many people know that now in the in the maps you can show relationship as well. So um, let me then sorry uh, change this to the um, to show the attributes. As, as I said before, uh, if you have in your program, if you have attributes or data elements which value type is a coordinate, then they are going to be show up as a, as a map layer. So you can select in this case the GPS attribute, and this is a color just to, for you to differentiate in the map. But you are because you can display many things at the same time in the map. So we are using this this label over here to that you can configure as well in the server to show the the the, the color that represents the, the GPS attributes. So I click on apply, and I, I can see that I have two. Okay. Again, these are not the I coordinates, these are attribute coordinates. That can be, for instance, the, the location of the patient or, or well, it can be whatever you want. Okay. Uh, more things, other features that we have for into four is, let me go back to my TI coordinates. Okay. Um, we have also now it's possible to display my current location. So I am here. I am the, this blue dot over here. In previous versions, we were not able to to show the the where the user was, but here you can. Okay, and I think that is very useful because now you can also navigate to the location that to to a selected location. So for instance, say that you want to navigate to this location. That maybe I don't know. Maybe it's a household where where is living where there is a malaria case living the okay so now that is selected you can click on this button and then on this button it will like open the different maps app that can navigate the, this different location in my case it, it will be like google maps but if you have other map app you can you can use any any other maps that you that you would like so i'm going to click here okay so it's going to open uh, google maps okay and then i if i click directions Okay, will show me the, the path. Well, you know, you all know how this works. Okay, but now I think it's a nice way that we are connecting like uh, DHS to our Android application with a, uh, with a, uh, uh, with a, any map application that you have in the in the phone that it can navigate different uh, GPS points. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back a bit. Okay. So the last feature that we have uh, that we, I, I would like to show is the working list. Um, you know, at the end working list, as Marcus was explaining, is uh, there are like filters, kind of filters that are stored in the in the database that are persisted, right? So uh, let me then go back to the to the um, to the DHS to web platform. So I'm going to use if you use the capture application. Okay, and now I'm selecting the, um, the in Hello Home. So I am selecting the uh, malaria case registration. In this case, it's an event program. Okay, and I see that I, I can see that I have three three working lists: events assigned to anyone, events assigned to me, events to they. So I can click on those, and then it will like apply the filters, right? And they, they are persisted in the in the backend. So now, how can I display these filters? 
So in Android, if you go, for example, I'm going to now go to the um, to the this same program uh, to the malaria malaria registration. So then I'm going to click on the filter button again. Okay, and now I can see that this field, those working lists are also presented here. So basically I can navigate and I can say, for example, okay, I just want to see all the events that are, that are assigned to me. So I click on this and these are the events that have been assigned to me. And also you can see that how this filter are like automatically updated. Okay, if you select this, it, it is also again uh, moving to the default direction. So uh, you can apply as many filters as you want. Uh, there are no events that have been conducted today, uh, events assigned to me, events assigned to anyone else. Um, so this works in events, but also it works in Tracker the same way. Okay, so you have working list working in tra on Tracker, so it will show up here as you are watching this in for events. Um, okay, and I think that this is all for uh, for our Android application. But as probably uh, most of you know, we in Android, the Android team, we are not only working in a, on a, on the Android application itself, uh, but we are also promoting uh, the Android what we call the Android Settings Web App. Okay, in the Android Settings Web App is in the current version. It's in the one to one dot one. Okay, so this version that are going to demo here is not ready yet published, but it's going to be out, I hope, in the next during the next two weeks. Okay, so this application, uh, just like a quick reminder, normally gives you more possibility about uh, the current version about uh, having more uh, granularity for synchronization. Okay, so for instance, uh, you can like select, okay, I would like to download for the user to download a maximum of 500 TIs or 1,000 TIs. Or also, you can specify the frequency of the the frequency of the of the synchronization, or you can specify if you want the TI to be uh, to be uh, synchronized only the TIs which enrollment status is active, or the ones that is complete, or a, from from a particular enrollment date. So there are a lot of possibilities if you use this app that is completely optional, but uh, we we strongly recommend it for you to try. Okay. So what is new in this to in this new version of this application? Okay, so uh, let me then go into the um, Android settings app. Well, first of all, if you have used the previous version, you see that this version, the, the layout is completely different because right now we are using this app not only for synchronization, but also for changing the layout of the Android application and for defining anal different analytic items. Okay, let's go step by step. So if I click on general, I have what I said in the, in the uh, previously in the, when I started this presentation, that is about the, you can use Matomo now as a, as a, in your organization, as a, as a, as a platform, as a web platform to analyze the usage of, of, of uh, the Android, uh, this application in your, in your context. Okay. So for that, you can define this using this application and you have to add here the, the URL, the, of Matomo that you're using. And then Matomo, inside Matomo, you can define a different project and the, any project will have an ID. And then you, you should be able, you have to enter in the ID in this, in this box over here. Uh, probably we are going to send uh, like kind of documentation to the community. Uh, so don't worry if I'm going too fast now for this particular part. Uh, but just wanted to let you know that if you plan to use Matomo, if you want to have like a kind of analysis based on how the user is using this application, you need to use this, the, the Android settings for that in order to configure the URL and all that. Here, just a quick reminder, we can like set up also the, the SMS gateways number. And then what is important that is not new, but is interesting to, to, to remind is that in this box, you can, if you mark this box, all, uh, Android devices, the database of all Android devices will be encrypted. Okay, so careful if you are using this. Then nothing new in the synchronizations about the, the um, uh, programs here. You can like, as I said before, you can specify the number of TIs that you would like to synchronize. In this case, it's 200, but you can put here any number. 
if the enrollment, the what is enrollment status for synchronization, the uh, the TI enrollment date within any time, last last month, last three months. Okay, we can have different parameters. What is new? So the appearance here, as I said before, we can configure uh, different um, different uh, items in the in the application. Mainly, well, there are two main items that are the, the filters and then the, the spinner. And this, why these two items are not others because we, uh, is what the community told us. Okay, so basically some, some people, and I think they are right because it really depends on the, on the, on the, um, on the, on every implementation. So uh, for example, we have filters at the home level. Okay, in this case, we are showing these four filters. And then if I am, for example, navigating to a program, the child program, I have all these filters, seven filters. Okay. And there are some people for some implementation that say, okay, but this is too complex for us. We really don't need filters. We know what we are doing. We are not going to filter by your unit. We are not going to be filled. We are not going to filter by assigned to me, the events assigned to me or by even dates or whatever, right? So why uh, an end user needs to see all this list of different filters? Because it, it is really confusing them, okay? So now we have a way here using this application. So I'm going to run an example now that if, for instance, I can say, okay, I, I only want to, I just want to skip the assigned to me. I don't want to show this in any program and the single status and the organization unit. Okay, and then also this applies to all the programs, but then you can also be specific. You can also see, okay, this is the default behavior about all the programs, but I have one program that has some specific behaviors so that, that I don't want to apply all this rule that I have defined here. So in this case, I can use, for example, this box and say, okay, the child program, I just want to just remove all the, all the filters Okay, I just want to show only have I just only want to show a filter for the user that is enrollment date. Okay, and then also I there are people that are not happy with the spinner that is marks the completion of the data entry form. So uh, also that's the reason because we are now uh, having this as an option. Okay, the default is like all the programs are and programs are going to show the spinner uh, the percentage of completion spinner. But then if you unselect this, let's see what is going to happen. So I save the program and save uh, this configuration. Okay, and now I need to uh, synchronize again the metadata. You need to synchronize again the metadata. Okay, it's... and now while this is like um, uh, synchronizing, just wanted to mention quickly that with the data set is the same, right? So this, you can filter at three levels home screen programs and data sets. Data sets you can apply, as I said before, like global filtering, but also you can add a specific uh, filter for us, uh, a filter for a specific data sets as well. Okay, in this case, you have this possibility for the category combo, periods or unit and sync status of the values. Okay, but let's go back and see if the synchronization, okay, is already done. So um, I'm going to home again, and here I'm going to present how this was for the program. So uh, now if I open the Malaria Crisis and Nosis Treatment and Investigation, it should only sh show up these four filters. Okay, so let let's go. Okay, I click here on the filter and yes, exactly. I see all these four filters that has been selected here. Okay, what happened now if I am going to the child program that I have as, a, as, an, specific, as an specific program? So in this case, I should only have one the enrollment date as a filter. And let's see if that's correct or not. Okay, here we go. We have the, the date of enrollment. Uh, moreover, we can like, uh, as if you remember, we have the selected this, the, the, the spinner. Uh, so if I am open any, I don't know, any TI, um, click on birth, you see how now there is no spinner over here. Okay, so for the implementation, for the people that didn't like this visual component, now you, you can use the Android settings app in order to remove it from your uh, Android devices. 
Okay, let's move on and, and talk about analytics. That is going to be my my last uh, my last feature to present here. And as I said before, now uh, we can render in the enrollment scope. We can render like charts. We can render uh, pivot tables. But with using this app, you can also um, have uh, more control about the analytic items that you would like to show to the users. So let's how how we can do that. So if I click here in the Add DI Analytics, so then first I need to select my program, type program, the program stage, that is the baby postnatal. Baby postnatal is a repeatable program stage. And then the title, uh, that can be child program, uh, hate evolution by Jose. Okay, that's the surname, I'm not interested. Then the visualization type, I'm going to use the bar chart. I can use whenever, whatever. Just a period type, monthly. Just an element type, it's going to be a data element or a program indicator or, or even an attribute. If it is an attribute, it's going to show only a one value, not like an evolution, of course. And then which is the data element? Is the, in this case, is height. Okay, so I save it. And now I have saved it here in this part of the application. So now I can, uh, maybe you want other item. Okay, so pay postnatal. In this case, can be like uh, the weight. Uh, this is a line chart. Pay type is monthly. Element type data element. Choose data element, this is the weight. Okay, once that is done, okay, I have these two new items that I would like to show in the child program. Okay, I click on save. Okay, and now I'm going with my mobile application, I'm going to uh, synchronize again. Settings, sync configuration. Okay, and while you're thinking, uh, I'm not going to be able to demonstrate this now, but for you to know that also, uh, because it was very much demanded by the community, we are we can also show uh, WHO nutrition graphs. Okay, it's not ready yet, but the, again, this is uh, um, a part of the Android Settings app that is going to be published in, in the next couple of weeks. So, uh, but in any case, once that the Android Settings app is ready, uh, you are going to be able to see WHO nutrition charts in your mobile application. Okay, in 2.4, we don't need to wait for two more of, for the next patch release. No, this is going to be available in, in 2.4 right now. Okay, so the way that, let me show you how it will work. So in this case, you see that these are the kind of charts that we have. We have the WHO nutrition, and then this will change what is a, a new type of nutrition chart that you would like to show. Height for age, uh, weight for age, if you can select this. And then what is the attribute? You know that uh, for you need to mark the the well, I just said the program. Uh, sorry. Very postnatal. That's nutrition, height for age. Okay, and then you, you can say, you can select, okay, what is the gender data element attribute that you have to represent? What is the attribute that you have to represent the gender? You select the gender. I mean, we are going to document this well, so don't worry, but just to let you know that we are going to be able to show W2 charts. Okay, then what is the female option? If it is F, okay, M, or whatever. And then what is the data element that goes in the axis and the data element that goes in the, in the uh, vertical? Okay, so this one should be ready in two weeks. Um, but okay, now the probably the synchronization has been made. Uh, so let well, let me just be, yes. So uh, I click, I go to home, I go to child program. And now if I open the SMTI that I opened it yesterday, sorry, I, that I opened it not yesterday, but uh, uh, at the beginning of my presentation. Okay, now uh, let me, Cancel this. And you see this that I have two these two items. And now if I'm moving to my analytics. So you see now that I have one that was bar chart and another that was line chart. Okay, and they don't have I don't have other other visualizations. So in the case you want to have control about what kind of analysis the user can the users can uh, can use, uh, you should use the, the Android settings web app, the version two. Uh, 
And I think that's it uh, for my presentation. Max, I don't know who's going to take over now. I think that's actually it as far as the presentations go. Um, so if any of you have any desire to say any last words before we wrap up, it looks like we've answered all the questions that were posed in the chat. Um, if not, then I guess I'll thank everyone for joining us. Uh, it's really appreciate all the presenters work today. Obviously all the developers work that went into these releases. Um, we will be publishing the video of this um, event on our YouTube channel and we'll post a link to that video in the community practice. And we're hoping to have more events like this in the future. So um, definitely join the community practice or mailing list if you haven't already, so you can receive notifications about those webinars as they're scheduled.